Greetings. Let me begin with a word of prayer. Most gracious, loving God, we thank you for your hand of blessing on our lives every day. We thank you for the peace and the joy that you give us, uh, the indwelling of your Holy Spirit that enables us to know you as our Lord and Savior. And I pray, Father God, that you'd give us ears to hear whatever you would speak to us. And Lord, as I speak, let, let my words be from your lips to the ears of all those who listen this day. In Jesus' name I pray with great expectancy. Amen. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, it's a wonderful opportunity that I have here to speak to you. And I want to start by sharing a thought that I had this past Christmas. I was watching one of the favorite musicals that our family likes to watch, and that's about Scrooge with Albert Finney. And when he's with the uh, spirit of, of Christmas present, uh, they sing a song. And, and part of the lyrics are, I love life. And I kept thinking about that. I kept, I kept humming that. I kept thinking to myself, you know, I love life. And I'm sure you love life too. And I'm <clears throat> truly delighted that my mother chose to give me life uh, at my birth. And I weighed 10 pounds, two ounces. And that part didn't make her happy. In fact, I never got a birthday card after that. And I'm just kidding. She sent me many birthday cards, but you know, 10 pounds, two ounces, that was a pretty healthy baby, right? And all you women now are going, whoa, that's a big baby, you know, but I love life. And as I'm sharing this with you, I'm reminded of the words from our Declaration of Independence. And I want to read just a portion of that to you right now. It says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are what? life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. I don't know what dreams my mother and dad had for me when I was born, but I, I do know that they chose to give me life and they set me on a pathway. I went to a Christian school, Lutheran school growing up and in high school and so on. And I'm not sure what my mom and dad had in store for me. I do know that my dad always prayed that one son would be a teacher and the other son a preacher. And my brother's a teacher and lo and behold, I'm a, I'm a pastor for 40, almost 45 years. I guess his prayer was answered uh, for both of us. And God does answer prayer, doesn't he? And we should have that expectancy that when we pray, that we believe that God is going to answer our prayers. Now, <clears throat> when I was thinking about this portion of the Declaration of Independence, I kept thinking about that phrase, the creator in doubt. And basically, I, I think there are two world views in our culture. And I think it's important for us to understand that and, and perhaps to review them. Uh, there are two worldviews that try to answer three questions. What is the origin of the universe? And what's the origin of life? And thirdly, what is the origin of man or mankind or, or humankind? And those are three questions that science and culture tries to answer. And it really boils down to what I would call two worldviews. One is secular humanism and the other is a biblical or, or creational view uh, of the world. And let me say this, both of these are scientific theories, apotheses. In other words, they're believed, but they can't be proven with empirical facts. Whether you're a creationist, a, a biblical-based view, or a secular humanist, it's theory. It's not based on empirical, provable facts. In fact, both systems are faith systems. So. What is secular humanism? Here's the definition. Humanism with regard in particular to a belief that humanity is capable of morality and self-fulfillment without, without belief in God. In other words, there's no room in secular humanism for a, a belief in God. I'm reminded of Karl Marx, you know, the father of communism, who, who said religion is the opiate the drug of the masses. So from a secular humanistic point of view where there's no God, they begin to lay out uh, some answers to those three questions. So what is their answer for the origin of the universe? Well, they have none. In fact, the best they could come up with is what we refer to as the Big Bang Theory. <laughs> the Big Bang Theory. That's their answer. But what about the question of, of life? Well, they have no answer for that either. You know, did lightning uh, strike a swamp and create a uh, life? 
And that behooves the question, okay, well, where'd the lightning come from? Where'd the swamp come from? They have, again, have no answer. And then we get to the last question. Where uh, did man come from? Where did life in human beings become? And the best they can come up with is the missing link. The missing link. And again, when you look at secular humanism without God, their belief system says that there's really no answer. They're just kind of throwing darts at the wall, trying to come up with, with, with something. So let's look at the biblical view. The biblical view of these same three questions. You know, what is the origin of the universe, the origin of life, and the origin of man? And you know what's really cool is that you can find all three answers in the Bible in the first book, the book of Genesis, and in the first chapter. All these questions are answered. So in verse 1, it says simply this, In the beginning God created what? The heavens and the earth. That's the first part of our creed, the Apostles' Creed. And you know, and the Bible never tries to argue for the existence of God. If you look at the uh, entire Bible, the 69 books, the assumption is God exists. He doesn't have to justify himself or explain himself. God is. Yahweh, God said, I am. So where did the universe come from? Genesis 1-1, God created it. And then where did life come from? Well, a couple of verses. Verse 20 and 24 says this, and God said, let the waters teem with living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth and let the land produce living creatures according to their own kind. Isn't that amazing that in the very first book of the Bible, in the first chapter, we find the answers to those three questions, the origin of the universe and the origin of life and the origin of man? Think about it. You know, we don't have to scratch our head and try to figure it out. We believe in God. We know our God's capable. He's omnipotent, all-powerful. Our God is omniscient, all-knowing. Our God is omnipresent, present everywhere. With him, all things are possible. Our God created the universe. Now look, they're both faith systems. Neither the creation view or, or the secular humanist view has the empirical data. It's to be received and believed in faith. And both theories are simply believed by faith. We believe that our God created. Now, let me just back up for a moment, look at the secular humanists. Now, you have to remember, from their perspective, there's no God that created the universe, all right? No God created the universe. So, life to them is not sacred. It simply has a beginning and an end. You're born and you die, and that's it. There's nothing before, nothing after. So, natural death and life basically is all you have. And, and by the way, if that's it, there's no eternal value. There's no eternal life. There's no reason to, to think that there's going to be something beyond the, the natural evolutionary process. Now, think about this. If you're simply a product of the evolutionary process, then you must make responsible choices to keep Mother Earth fit for going on with the evolutionary process. Now, what does that mean? It means that Mother Earth's here allowing evolution to move on and we have to be responsible. We have to take care of the climate because if the climate gets out of balance, it may disrupt the evolutionary process. We have to be sensitive to the, to the, uh, to the earth, to the, to the vegetation, to, to the water, natural resources. Because again, if you tamper with that, there may be a disruption of the evolutionary process. Think about this, you know, the 2,000 minnows down there that are on the verge of extinction, from this viewpoint, may be the next link in the evolutionary process. So it, we can't destroy them, we have to protect them because we don't want to disrupt the evolutionary process that's in place, which is very godless, by the way. And listen, another important understanding of this process is population control. In other words, the, the, the uh, secular humanists believe the world should be around 5 billion people. Right now we're pushing 8 billion. That's 3 billion too many. So what do you do about that? Well, you have a one-child policy, which they applaud in China. You know, have, one, have less children. Or you have abortion, which eliminates children. Or euthanasia, which uh, takes, you know, a recent politician made the statement that once you have 75, perhaps you don't need any medical care. But what, what is driving this thought? What is driving it is keeping 
uh, the, the planet in balance so it can sustain itself in order to ensure that the evolutionary process continues. You've got to get your mind around this and realize that this is no small thing. That if this belief system gets whole, then it keeps everything uh, in a position uh, of balance. But it devalues life because life is not sacred. Life, as we know it from this perspective, is just stepping stones to the next generation of life, whatever that may be and however it may come. So this basically are, are the two worldviews, secular humanism without God or a creation biblical view uh, with God. And my, my question to you is, where are you in this process? Are, are you a biblical creation view person? Or are you a secular humanist? Ponder that. And I'm sure most of you in this Bible class listening to me are sensitive to the fact that we are God-fearing, God-believing people. And we've already answered in our heart that question, that we are biblical view, creationist view people. I believe that many in our culture are moving away from a God view. In other words, they're trying to do everything they can to basically remove God from the culture. Think about the things that have transpired. They've tried to take God completely out of the public space. You know, there's no room for prayer uh, in the public arena, in schools, for instance, or anywhere else, football fields, games, or whatever. Uh, you can't say Merry Christmas because it's offensive. It's a separation of church and state. You know, there's no freedom of speech, freedom of the exercise of religion and that. You're simply told you can't bring your faith into the public arena. It's embarrassing, it's insulting, it's against the rules. Now, just freeze frame that in your mind for a moment. I want you to think about this. If you remove the rule maker, then you don't, no longer have to apply his rules uh, to life. You know, Time Magazine in, in the 70s had a front page article that said, God is dead. The claim was simply this, God's dead, therefore you can make up your own rules. Now, let me just back up for a moment and tell you how ludicrous that is. If you're going to play any sporting event, you've got to have rules to play by or you can't play the game. And too often, if you don't have umpires or, or uh, referees, you still can't play the game because they're there to keep things in check. I can remember as a, you know, playing sandlot baseball you know, without umpires. And the pitch would come in and there'd be a big argument, was that a strike or a, or a ball? Look, we need rules in order to play games to live life. And we need rule makers to tell us what the rules are. But yet we are in a culture now that has eliminated, to a great extent, the rule maker. That's secular humanism. Secular humanism wants to get rid of rules made by a God, made by a God they don't believe in. Now, Think about some things that have transpired in our culture, good, bad, or indifferent. But divorce back in the 50s was regulated by biblical principles. You don't get divorced unless you can prove that one of the parties committed adultery. And, and sadly enough, too often people had to take the fall and, and lie rather than own up to something. And that, but that was changed. That was changed in the 60s to what we call mutual consent. It was no longer a biblical application, but it's simply a decision made from within oneself to say, you know what, I want out of this, of this marriage. So it moved from a biblical principle to mutual consent. Now you and I may think, well, it's no small thing. But it, again, it was an erosion of, of biblical principle. You know, when, when the morals of a culture leave, then people are left to their own designs. I can remember in the late 60s, early 70s, we were in the season of free love. You know, all the, all the magazines and periodicals and, and things were, were promoting free love, love without morality, love without boundaries. And then on the heels of that came abortion. Why? Because pregnancies were unwanted. Pre pregnancies were not planned. People didn't want the, the, the inconvenience of a pregnancy. So the government enabled people to get abortions. And we'll get to that in a moment. But think about some other things. From that came what we call gender confusion. 
You know, today, let me say this, friends. Today, your biological sex, male or female, does not determine your gender. If you look at the culture today, what determines your gender is how you feel about yourself, not based on your, your biological birth, sex. So whether you're a male or female biologically doesn't determine your gender because you have the right, the right to decide what you want to be. And you and I back up and say, wait a minute, that doesn't even make any sense. Well, you know why? Because it doesn't make any sense. But again, that's the slippery slope that our culture is sliding down. And of course, this leads to the disintegration of what I'm going to call traditional family. Back in Genesis, God said, a man and a woman shall come together and create life. And that life will be the family. And you raise your children. And that whole traditional family understanding that's been around for millenniums, thousands and thousands of years has now been disintegrated. And in fact, people argue against the traditional family, say it's evil, uh, it's bad, it's not good. You see where this has gone? When you remove God and, 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 and his word out of the culture, then the culture is in, in its own madness, developing whatever it wants to, that fits the narrative of the moment. You know, the real question is, are we a godly nation? Are we moving quickly toward godlessness? Are we a godly nation? Now let's go back to the abortion issue. On um, <clears throat> January 22nd, 1973, the Supreme Court ruled that it was a right of a woman to have an abortion. Now, since that time, it's estimated that conservatively that there's been, since 1973, 60 million abortions in this country alone. Worldwide, it's a, it's a much higher number, they think. But 60 million lives were snuffed out. Now, let's go back to that declaration that I read earlier. We hold these truths to be what? Self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, what's the problem? The problem is if you remove God from this equation, if you re remove God, then you're left to your own selfish desires. In other words, whatever I want, whatever I desire, that's my right. It has nothing to do with a vertical connection with God who endowed this, but it's a lateral move of decision based on my understanding of, of self. Let me renew, review for a moment. Let me review what I said about the definition of secular humanism. Humanism with regard, in particular, to the belief that humanity, listen to this, humanity is capable of morality and self-fulfillment without belief in God. In other words, it says take God out and now you and your newfound wisdom can generate anything you want to because that becomes the new morality, which almost always is self-serving. We've removed God who endowed us with these rights and declared that our rights are generated from within. And, and that's maddening, and that's, that's dangerous to say the least. We, listen to this, and this is key, we have deified, we have deified our individual rights in this country. That means my individual rights as a human being usurps God if he exists in the culture. You understand? We've made our individual rights our God, and we can't defile that. Whatever I want, my individual right usurps everything else. And if God doesn't exist, then my individual rights, in fact, become my God. Is that where we want to go as a nation? that we let individual rights become the God of this nation? Don't be fooled, don't be fooled. Individual rights in this culture become the prevailing God of the land. Now, the biblical view is that the right to life is for all life, which is sacred. God created us in his image. If we're in the image of God, then we have a sacred image and it makes our life valuable. It makes it precious. It makes it sacred. Now listen, people fail and falter and sin. We all do. Even though I've been created in the image of God, I, I'm a sinner. I, I blow it in a thousand different ways. 
because by nature I'm sinful. But we have to understand, sin is not acceptable by God. Look, we, we have to love the sinner and not the sin, but sin is not acceptable by God. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, when they, when they defied God's command and walked away, when they listened to the serpent, they sinned. They, they brought in sin for all humanity. In fact, in Romans 5, 12, it says, by one man sin entered into the world. We're all paying the consequence of the sin of Adam and Eve. Uh, but furthermore, let me just say this about good and evil. You know, God's good. He, he's good. Everything God created, it says in Genesis, was good. So where does evil come from? I'm glad you asked that. I believe evil comes from the decision we make to move away from God or against God. God is good. And, and, and when we're good, we're moving with God or for God or, or, or toward God. That's good. But as soon as we rebel and move away from God, that's evil. Satan rebelled in heaven. He was thrown out. That He brought in evil. And the goodness of Adam and Eve in that garden, when they were trusting God and his promise to take care of them, they began to doubt. And then they crossed the line and evil came in and plagued us for all time with their sinful nature. The nature of sin that continues to pound us today. And, you know, Adam and Eve were cursed along with the serpent. You know, Adam's curse was, you no longer going to have free ride, son. You're going to have to go out and work for a living. You're going to have to roll up your sleeves, and by the sweat of your brow, you're going to have to work for a living. And he said to Eve, listen, your curse is going to be childbirth pain and a desire for your husband. Think about it. The desire for your husband is going to be your curse? Yeah. Get the picture. Adam going after his career and, and the woman chasing uh, the husband. And can't, can't catch him because he's focused on making a living. But the servant, the serpent's curse is the one I want you to look at. In Genesis 3.15, it says this, And I will put enmity, I'll put war between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He will crush your head, and you will bruise his heel. And listen, from that point forward, Satan's primary goal has been to destroy the seed of promise. Because he knew that the war was, was going to be against the seed of the woman. He didn't know what that meant in, in the immediate, but he knew it was going to have to be uh, eliminated or, or taken care of. So Satan's war was against life, to terminate life, to destroy life, uh, so life could not go forward. And so what happens? You've got Adam. And the seed of promise was not Cain and Abel, but Seth, it says in the Bible. And Seth begat Noah, and Noah then Abraham. And then Abraham gave birth to Isaac, who was the seed of promise. Not Ishmael, but Isaac, who had, had uh, Esau and Jacob. And Esau was not the seed of promise, but it was uh, Jacob. And then it goes down to Judah, and then David, and eventually uh, to Jesus. And Jesus was the seed of promise. And, you know, in fact, if you think about the Mary being told by the angel, you're going to give birth to a son. He's going to be the son of God. He was the seed of promise. And then he, he says to, to uh, her husband, Joseph, in a dream, don't destroy the seed of promise. Protect it. It's sacred. And so he woke up and, and, and went against the entire culture and didn't take his right to destroy Mary but protected the seed of promise because God said to. You know, that was the greatest dream that changed history, wasn't it? When Joseph woke up having a dream saying, this is not any man's seed, this is the seed sown by, like, by God himself. And he received it and embraced it and protected her. And as a result, Mary gave birth. And again, Satan tried to sniff it out, didn't he? He, he sent Herod. Herod, when the wise men said Bethlehem is where the seed of promise is going to be born, he sends a contingent down to destroy every child under two. But again, in a dream, the wise men left. And in a dream, Joseph is warmed and goes to Egypt because God was going to protect his seed of promise. That's the God we serve. A God who has a plan and a purpose. A God who's all-knowing and omniscient. A God who is all-powerful. God has a desire for life. He gives life. 
He loves it so much he wants to extend it into the next realm that we, we call eternal life. But going back for a moment to that quest of Satan to destroy life. You know, there are over 30 passages in the Bible where God says, don't destroy the life of children. In Leviticus 18 verse 21, God says, don't sacrifice your children to Molech. Why? Because Molech was the god of fertility. And the Israelites knew that if they were going to be fertile and, and have more pleasure in that, they needed to sacrifice their children. They, they drank the Kool-Aid. They, they bought into the narrative over and over and over again. It says in Jeremiah 7, 13, that they burned their children before the idols of the pagans. That's human nature. God's own people were violating the, the, the code and doing exactly what God told them not to do and that they were sacrificing their children. And listen, Satan was after the seed of promise in the Old Testament. And once Jesus was born, then he understood that the seeds of promise were going to be ushered into uh, all humanity. And I want to explain exactly what I'm talking about. So while Satan is on this quest to, to eliminate the seed of promise, God's protecting. I mentioned that with Joseph and Mary. But I want to read Revelation chapter 12, verse 3 to 6. Very powerful portion of Scripture the last book of the Bible. It says this, Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its head. And its tail swept away a third of the stars and of the sky and flung them to the earth. Flung them to the earth. And the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that she he might devour the child the moment it was born. You see, Satan knew this seed of promise must be eliminated. But then it goes on. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter, and her child was snatched up to God to his throne. In other words, the ascension. Where Jesus now has his feet resting on the footstool of this earth and all creation. And then it goes on and says, The woman fled, the church fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God where she will be taken care of for 1260 days. That's the New Testament era, age, where, where the church is, is the bride of Christ waiting for his uh, re return. But what's most significant about this is the church is made up of believers. And it says in Galatians 4, through Jesus Christ, we become God's adopted children, that we become heirs to the promise of God through Jesus Christ. In other words, every child, male or female, born into this world has the opportunity through Jesus Christ to be born again to a new life, which takes them beyond the grave, the natural death, into a world of eternity where we can live with God forever. That's the beauty of God's plan, that through the seed of promise, we have the benefit to live with God forever. You know, in Psalm 139, it says something very profound. It said, look, God created you with his own hand. It says, God thoughts about you were so wonderful that they outnumbered the grains of sand on the planet. And lastly, it says that God scheduled every day of your life. In other words, God knows the exact time when you're going to die and be with him. He scheduled every day. He laid out a plan for your life because he was that concerned about you as his beloved. Read Psalm 139. It's a powerful psalm. It also says that God knows exactly when Paul Teske is going to die. There's nothing I can do to advance it. Or hinder it, I'm going to die when my time is up. I can't add to that or, or take away from it. That's the God we serve. When you have a belief in God, when you can trust God with your life, you have to trust him with all of it. And there's nothing I can do to say. When, when it's my time to go home, I'm going home. And believe me, I'm not coming back to this goofy planet. Why would anybody come back here? Amen? We're going there where it says we're going to be free of the pain and the sorrow and the suffering and all the stuff. Life is sacred. Life is sacred. Your life is sacred. God made you with his hand. He scheduled every day of your life. His thoughts about you were amazing and wonderful. Outnumbering the grains of sand on the planet. Now look, sin disrupts. Sin disrupts us all and condemns us. But God gives us the ability to, to embrace the gift he gives us in Jesus Christ by faith, the redemptive work on the cross by his blood. 
God gives us the ability to confess our sin and receive forgiveness, redemption for all that we've done, for all that we haven't done, things we've neglected. His mercy prevails. Look, we all have to acknowledge sin for sin. We can't whitewash it. We can't write it off. Sin is sin. It, it's, it's, when we sin, we move against God, but God's arms are wide open and he's ready to embrace us and, and bring us home. I love what it says in Micah 7, verse 8. God delights in mercy and not judgment. God delights in mercy. It reminds me of a story, a college professor. He had about 300 kids in a class. and He said, look, <clears throat> your whole grade is going to be predicated on three papers. They're due on October 1st, November 1st, December 1st. Don't be late. That's your grade. So October 1st rolls around. About 20 hands go up. Don't have their papers. He says, okay, I'm going to cut you a little slack. Be on time the next time. November 1st rolls around, about 50 hands go up, no papers. He says, okay, 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 look. I'm gonna cut you some slack, but listen to me, class. Anybody whose paper's late on December 1st is gonna get an F. December 1st rolls around, 300 students, 100 hands go up, we don't have our paper. He says, oh, Mr. Smith, where's your paper? Don't have it, F. Miss Brown, where's your paper? Don't have it, F. And here's a voice in the back. Mr. Teske, you just said it's not fair. Did you have your paper in on October 1st? No, sir. F. How about October 1st? No, sir. F. You see, that, that's justice. Mercy is forgiveness, and our God delights in mercy. We need to be a people who are faithful, who confess our sin and, and repent. And God will do his part to forgive us because he loves us that much. We all know the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. The power lies, look, in Jesus Christ. He is the one that redeems us on the cross. Jesus is the one who went to the grave and the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead in order to show us that God has power over death, the grave, and the devil. It's a free gift to be received by faith to any man or woman. And it is the power of God. It gives you the truth of Jesus Christ, crucified and risen. It gives you God's love that, that, that saturates you and, and fills you with his security. It gives you God's peace. It crowns you with his peace that will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. It's, it's the hope that God gives you. An expectancy. It's, it's the joy of the Lord that surrounds you morning, noon, and night. It's the faith that rises up in the midst of a world that denies God, where you can say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty. He created the heavens and the earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, and I believe in the Holy Spirit. You see, we have a God of truth and power. What does the enemy have? He's the father of lies. He's got nothing to give you but an empty bag. He'll give you a despair in the place of hope. He'll give you doubt in the place of faith. He'll give you fear in the perfect love. Uh, love. You know, think of perfect love casts out fear, right? Satan has to eat. Fear is all he's got to give you. And if you're being seized by fear right now, if your life is gripped with fear, if you're debilitated by fear, say, Lord, pour your love in. Romans 5, 5 from your throne. Saturate every cell in my body. But Satan, he'll give you fear. He'll give you doubt. He'll give you despair. He'll, he will give you a sadness. He has nothing else to offer. But that's not the God we serve. We serve a powerful God who overcame all of that, who gives us the victory in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen? Don't live an anxious life. Let the peace of God crown you. And again, as it says in Philippians 4, 7, guarding your what? Heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Look, today's a big day. And I'm going to end it with a, with a word from Joshua, the great leader. On his retirement, Joshua chapter 24, he, he gives a speech to the Israelites, refreshing their memory of all that God has done. And, and this is what he says in verse 14 and 15. He says, now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. All faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your ancestors who worship beyond the Euphrates and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day day whom you'll serve, whether the gods of your ancestors beyond the Euphrates 
or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living today. But he says this, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Who are you going to serve? Are you going to serve the gods of your past or the, or the gods of the land you're dwelling in right now, including that deified right? Are you going to serve the living God who created the heavens and the earth? The living God who created life and sanctifies life. The living God who created you in his image and will give you a place to live with him forever. That's the God I'm going to serve. And I will not be sucked into the quagmire of, of, of the culture and its lies or Satan and his lies, but I'm going to stand on the word of promise and truth that our God created, our God loves, our God forgives, our God redeems through Jesus Christ, his only precious son. I hope this has been helpful to you. I hope that I've been able to, to lift you up with these words and encourage you going forward. Look, I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring, but I know God's in the middle of it. I know he's good. I know that God always knows what he's doing. And I can trust him. And so can you. You can trust God. And you can know that he's good. And you can rest in the, the, the assurance that you are held right now in the palm of his hands. He'll never throw you under the bus. He'll never turn his back on you. You are his beloved son, a seed of promise through Jesus Christ, the real seed of promise. Amen? Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. And all God's people said, Amen.